So people are still coming in, but um, we are going to um, go ahead and, and get started. Um, let me just get my own screen set up properly. There we go. So I want to welcome you all and thank you for coming to the 2021 Gale Family Foundation Spring Lecture. My name is Tatiana Lichtenstein and I'm a di the director of the Center for Schusterman Studies here at UT Austin. These have been very challenging times for so many of us. And I, I know that um, uh, you know, people are, are very busy and I really appreciate that you, you take the time to come and join us tonight. And people are here from all over the country. Um, I'm so hopeful that in, within this year, we will be able to, to meet at a Gale lecture, many of us anyway, face to face. Um, I'm hoping that that's in the card for us all. Before we welcome our speaker today, Professor Barbara Kirschenblatt-Glimplett, I would like to extend my thanks to the sponsor of tonight's event, the Gale Family Foundation. Along with the Schusterman Foundation, the Gale Family Foundation has helped make Jewish studies not only a success here at UT Austin, but also a pioneer in the field. And I'd like to highlight just two examples of the variety of activities in Jewish studies that is supported by uh, the foundation's generosity and commitment to the field. The Gale Collaborative on Jewish Life in the Americas it, uh, is a research consortium directed by Dr. Naomi Lindstrom that facilitates shared projects for scholars from Canada, the US, Mexico, Argentina, and Israel. Every semester, the Gale Collaborative introduces wonderful artists and scholars whose work reflect the historical and the contemporary Jewish experience of the Americas. The Gale Foundation also enables us to pursue pioneering educational projects for our undergraduate students. In 2019, the center launched the Social Justice Internship Program in Jewish Studies. Through this program, students intern in organizations across Austin focusing on social justice, education, and the arts. Led by Dr. Susie Serif, students come together weekly to discuss Jewish texts and are joined by civic leaders to share their experiences and inspirations. The Gale Annual Lecture Series is, however, an event that predates and helped sow the seeds for the establishment of a center for Jewish studies here at UT Austin. Over the years, we've been able to bring to campus distinguished writers and commentators on Jewish life, culture, and politics. In some years, the prestigious Gale event has combined academic talks with musical and dance performances, as did our conference on Terezine and on Jewish folklore. Most recently, Deborah Lipstadt, Yossi Klein Halevi, Amy Jill Levine, and Eric Calera have been Gale lecturers. As they have for more than four decades, the Gale lecturers thus continue to, to perform a vital function. They introduce undergraduate and graduate students, faculty from across campus, and a broad off-campus audience to the world of Jewish academic studies, to Jewish arts and culture, and to observers of contemporary issues. And that is uh, the off-campus audience is particularly true in the Zoom world where we are really reaching much beyond uh, the state of Texas. Before I invite my colleague, Dr. Itzi Gottesman to introduce our speaker, a few thank yous and a few practical uh, comments. I'd like to thank the staff at the Schusterman Center, Senior Program Coordinator Galit Pedersur and the Center's Graduate Assistant, Nicole Farrell, as well as the Center's Associate Director, Dr. Jonathan Kaplan for their work on this event. Now about the webinar format. Since this is a webinar, you're muted. And that means that you can only pose your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen we very much hope you'll participate in the discussion after Dr. Kirschenblatt Gimblet's presentation. My colleague, Dr. Susie Seraph, and I will take the turns posing the questions to Dr. Kirschenblatt Gimblet. To get the best view setting, I encourage you to go to the right hand top corner of your screen and select the side by side uh, speaker mode or speaker mode. Um, you can also uh, manipulate the white line on your screen to make that image bigger. Uh, as I mentioned, we've enabled the closed captions as well for this session, and the session is also being recorded. We are learning this new, new technology, and 
All I can say is be patient and don't despair. Since we are recording it, should you have internet troubles, you can always go back and watch the recording later. You can watch it again if you enjoyed it or wanted to visit certain parts of it, and you can share it with your friends. Um, we'll make it available. We'll send you an uh, email with the link and make it available to you through in a few days through our YouTube channel. Um, you'll also be able to find it through our website. Now, let me introduce my colleague, Dr. Itzi Gottesman, who will be introducing Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet. Dr. Gottesman is a senior lecturer in the Department of Germanic Studies here at UT Austin. As a professor in the only Yiddish language and culture program in the American Southwest, Dr. Gottesman plays a key role in making UT the preeminent hub for Jewish studies in the region. Dr. Gottesman's Yiddish classes have garnered scholarly recognition, graduating undergraduate and graduate students who've gone on to be significant Yiddish academic and cultural figures. The Yiddish language and culture program serves as an, an important academic purpose within a large research and teaching institution such as UT Austin. Our multidisciplinary programming connects students and, and scholars from across academic units and disciplines, as well as archivists and curators working with our Yiddish collections at the Harry Ransom Center, a collection that includes Isaac Bashevi Singer's papers. Dr. Gottesman has written extensively on Yiddish folklore, research on folk songs, folk tales, and customs that he's currently compiling into a book. He's the creator and curator of a more than decade long online project called Yiddish Song of the Week that features rare field and home recordings of Yiddish folk singers. In the next year or two, he'll be completing a major digital project that makes more than 40 years of field recordings of Yiddish speakers, singers, and joke tellers available online as the Itzi Gottesman Collection of Yiddish Culture. Welcome, Itzi. Thank you, Tatiana. It is an honor for me to introduce Professor Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet. A few minutes are hardly enough to list all of her achievements and accomplishments. So we will concentrate mainly on those related to Jewish studies. She has had a profound influence on not one, but several academic fields and continues to surprise us with her originality and insight. Born in Toronto to two Jewish immigrants from Poland, much of her work has involved East European Jewish folklore in the old world, so to speak, as well as immigrant Jewish folklore in the new world. Before settling in as professor at NYU in the Performance Studies Department, where she chaired and taught for many years, she had faculty appointments in several universities, including the University of Texas in Austin from 1970 to 1972. Today, she is University Professor Emerita of Performance Studies at New York University. Her PhD thesis examined storytelling among Yiddish speaking Jews in Toronto, emphasizing the context of the storytelling event, rather than analyzing just the text, which is how earlier folklorists approached the subject. In 1973, Kirschenblatt Gimblet received an NEH grant to study the Yiddish folk song in context, which resulted in one of the most important projects in the history of Yiddish folk song study. The project was sponsored by the YIVO Institute of Jewish Research in New York, and she and her team of researchers not only recorded Yiddish songs from traditional folk singers, but also recorded their full repertory of song, including Polish, Ukrainian, and German songs, among others. For each song, there was an extensive questionnaire asking such questions as when the singer last sang the song, how did she feel about the song? My family first met Kirschenbaum Gimblet thanks to this project in which she interviewed my grandmother for 30 hours. Her interest particularly in Jewish immigrant culture led to the volume, They Called Me Meyer July, Painted Memoirs of a Jewish Childhood in Poland Before the Holocaust a collaborative effort which featured her father's folk paintings of, the, of his Polish town as he remembered it. His painting of the black wedding in the cemetery graced a recent UT Schusterman Center newsletter. Today, she is the Ronald Lauder chief curator of the core exhibition at the Poland Museum of the History of the Polish Jews, a beautiful building in the heart of Warsaw. She has been internationally recognized for her work there and her pioneering vision of how a museum exhibit 
should be constructed and function. In her groundbreaking book, Destination Culture, Tourism, Museums, and Heritage, she writes about the theories and history of museums and is on the advisory board of many museums around the world from New York to Moscow. She was decorated with the Officer's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland for her contribution to the Poland Museum. Among her other works are Image Before My Eyes, A Photographic History of Jewish Life in Poland, 1864 to 1939, together with Lucian Dobryszewski, The Art of Being Jewish in Modern Times with Jonathan Karp, Anne Frank, Unbound, Media, Imagination, Memory with Jeffrey Shandler. Christian Black Gimblet has received honorary doctorates from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America and the University of Haifa. And most recently, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In the field of folklore, she has served as president of the American Folklore Society and has been an important mentor to more than one generation of young scholars and grad students in the field. Finally, I would point out an aspect of Professor Kirschenblatt Gimblet that we will all benefit from today. She is a collector par excellence. Her massive book collection was featured in the New York Times. And a couple of weeks ago at the University of Aberdeen, she spoke about her collection of pandemic masks and how they, ref how they reflect what is going on in society. Today, we will hear about her personal unparalleled collection of Jewish cookbooks, and I am sure we are in for a treat. Thank you, Barbara. Well, thank you very, very much, Itzik. I want to, um, to say how delighted I am to have been chosen for the Gale Lecture, and I want to thank Itzik for, for suggesting me. And I especially want to thank those who uh, I worked with most closely in preparing for today. So Tatiana Lichtenstein and with um, Galil Pettiger and with Susie Seraf. So thank you very, very much. And of course, especially to the Gale Family Foundation for sponsoring these lectures. Now, as a folklorist, um, we study what other people overlook. And it could be said that uh, it's no, it's, it's no big deal to study something important, but it is a big deal to study what other people think is not so important. And that is at the heart of what a folklorist is. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if my video is on and is the speaker view for me on? I think that there's, there's something wrong with the display because I'm seeing other people. I'm not seeing Myself. You're working. You're working fine. Okay, so you can see me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, cookbooks are in that category of seeing, uh, uh, from an academic point of view, of seeming unimportant, and the uh, the joy of these cookbooks, cookbooks generally, but Jewish cookbooks and Yiddish cookbooks in particular, is how much can be learned from them if one knows how to read them. But that's not how I began. I actually. The way that I began collecting cookbooks, I have my collection now is between six and 7,000 volumes, just the cookbooks. And the way I began collecting was as a child. My very first cookbook was the textbook for the home economics class in my primary school in downtown Toronto in the 1940s and 1950s. And uh, when I would be waiting for my piano lesson, the, my piano teacher let me go down into the basement of her house where her husband had collected uh, decades of Better Homes and Gardens. I don't know whether he read them, what he was saving them for, but I, I figured he wouldn't notice if I clipped all of the adverts for a free product cookbook. Crisco, Maxwell House, Gold Medal Flower, it didn't matter what it was. So my, my collection really began with free product cookbooks. I didn't think of it at that time as a collection. I thought of it rather as, well, first of all, I love to get mail. So I thought of it as a way to get a lot of free mail. And also, I actually genuinely wanted to cook from them, and I did. But in time, uh, because I'd always had, from childhood, a very strong interest in food, I started to, I would say, accumulate cookbooks, and then that turned into collecting. But once it turned into collecting, the challenge was how to, how to manage what was an absolute ocean of material. The cookbooks are maybe the most uh, prolific genre of any genre and certainly the most prolific genre written uh, of, of books written by women. That's, that's for sure. 
So I thought, you know, I will, I will focus on Jewish cookbooks because I think at that point, probably in the 1970s, I was already specializing in East European Jewish culture and in Yiddish. So I thought, well, Jewish cookbooks. Well, it turned out that Jewish cookbooks are also a huge, huge category. And being a graduate student with very little income, I mean, really no income, uh, I thought, well, if I make the category even smaller, then maybe I would actually be able to afford to buy some of the really special ones. So I thought, well, I'll make it Yiddish cookbooks, which of course I assume would be a very small category. And in fact, it is a very small category. And then I discovered that was what was very interesting was to collect multiple editions of particular cookbooks, especially the ones that are historically important. But even beyond that, because the multiple editions, especially those that have been published, let's say in 13, 14, or in, in some cases, 30 or 40 editions over as long as a century, you can see a kind of evolution. They become like a time capsule and you can begin to register um, milestones in the evolution of the Jewish kitchen, Jewish life, the Jewish family, the lives of women, right across that entire period. So, so that's what I did. And what I thought I would do uh, tonight is what I'd like to do is to share with you, of course, gems from my collection, because collectors like nothing better to do than to show you uh, their very, very special volumes. But my goal really is to demonstrate what extraordinary resources these cookbooks are for doing the social Jewish social and cultural history and especially looking at the the lives and the role of women in orchestrating not only the home but well beyond it because as I as you'll see the women who wrote these cookbooks um, were not uh, what can I say some of them were obviously very experienced and they were no doubt some of them professional cooks whether in private homes, whether, whether in restaurants, uh, whether as caterers. So I think there's a really a huge range. So one of the interesting questions is, why did Jewish cookbooks appear relatively late on the scene? So we know, certainly if we're talking about Europe, uh, we know that there are already cookbooks in the medieval period. But if you look at the early cookbooks, they are invariably written by professional chefs it, from the royal court, or they're written by a professional chef who's working in a noble household. In other words, they're really professional cookbooks for other professional cooks, for chefs. They're not intended for domestic use. They're not intended for women to use in their kitchens. They're, they, they are very, 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 very specialized. But by the 18th century, we begin, we, I mean, certainly by the 18th century, we really see a flowering of cookbooks that are intended for domestic use. But we don't, we don't actually see that in the case of Jewish cookbooks until the 19th century. Now, I had the opportunity to see what I think maybe are the earliest Jewish cookbooks and their manuscripts in Yiddish in the, in the collection of the Prague Jewish Museum. And because there are several copies of them because they're manuscripts, it looks to me like they might have been used as text, as a kind of a textbook for uh, young brides or for young women who would be working in those households and need to know how to, how, how to cook basically. Now they are probably, I thought they were late 18th century. I think they're probably early 19th century. So essentially we're looking at the 19th century. So I, that's really gonna be my, my focus this evening. I mean, I will go all the way up to World War II, but the 19th century is this very, I would say very formative period and uh, and a very, very interesting one. So let me start with, the, so far as we know, the very, very first published, I would say, well, to call it a Jewish cookbook, I would say, actually, it's not a Jewish cookbook. It's a kosher cookbook. And I want to make the distinction between a kosher cookbook and a Jewish cookbook, because I think that uh, intuitively, one would say, well, if it's a kosher cookbook, then obviously it's a Jewish cookbook. But you'll see in a moment why I would argue that, that we should make the distinction. And I think it will be helpful in understanding the, the sequence of cookbooks that appeared in the 19th century. So the first one, which I think is very a very interesting one, was published in, in 1815. And who published it? A Catholic man. What is a Catholic man doing publishing a, and I insist, kosher cookbook? So. 
This is Joseph Stoltz. The cookbook's entitled, and I'll give it to you in the English translation of the title, and that is Cookbook, and it, he, it's, it, the people translated as Cookbook for Jews, but actually it's not. It's Kochbuch für Israeliten, because in the 19th century, particularly in Western Europe, but also actually in Poland as well, the word Jew was considered um, like the N-word. That is, that it was considered um, ugly, didn't sound good, and that it wasn't dignified. So you wouldn't say Jid, and you wouldn't uh, say Juif, and you wouldn't say Jude, but you, what you would say is, is Israelite, or our older brothers, or as Germans of the Mosaic faith, or Poles of the Mosaic faith, any anything not to say Jew. So this, so, so to be to translate it properly, it would be a kochbuch for Israelites, um, or practical instruction for preparing all kinds of the finest dishes according to the Jewish dietary rules. So, and actually, it it doesn't say that the the, the German says it, it. What it says is it's yeah no it does it says uh, religion Grundlagen. Uh, for the finest dishes that are to be prepared in a kosher way. So what is critical here is this is, well, and well, let me, let me tell you what the author said he thought he was doing and why he tells you why he is publishing this cookbook, this Catholic professional chef, and he is uh, publishing it in Karlsruhe in Germany. And he lived there and there were exactly 670 Jews, not exactly a big market. It appeared in one edition. And um, basically he says this, he says, as far as I know, no similar book of this kind has been available for the followers of the Mosaic faith. Again, don't say Jew. And for this reason, and for trying to be useful to many, I gladly acquiesced to the frequently repeated invitation of educated Jews and decided to let my manuscript be printed. So he's saying that somehow or other, there are these Jewish families that are entreating him to write the recipes down and then to print them. So how did that happen? And he explains, he says, as much as possible, constantly wishing to perfect myself in my trade, I gladly use the opportunity offered to observe the art of cooking in the houses of the most educated local Jews. This is incidentally his first cookbook. The first cookbook that this professional chef publishes is a kosher cookbook. Now, I wanna know what is he doing in the kitchen of the most educated local Jews? What is he doing in their kitchen? And he says, after becoming thoroughly familiar with its practice, I decided to improve certain things in the Jews method of cooking. So he says, the parts of dishes and ingredients which don't conform to the Mosaic laws or only at certain times, I substituted with other kinds so that the whole dish should be not only healthy and pleasing to the digestive organs, but also, but also at the same time, it should also conform in matters of taste to the requirements of the finer art of cooking. So this is the inauguration of the first Jewish cookbook and the first kind of Jewish cookbook, which is what I call kosher, gourmet, not Jewish. This is not a cookbook for anybody who wants to cook Jewish dishes, maybe non-Jews, but at that time that wasn't, that wasn't the case. The assumption here is that those who will buy this cookbook, and usually if these are the quote educated, which is a, a kind of a code language for elite or well-to-do, uh, those are people who, the, those, those women would not be in the kitchen. They would be supervising their servants. They'd be supervising their cooks and, and presumably until Stoltz came along with his cookbook, they would be cooking Jewish dishes as well as you know, anything else. So what did they need? They needed to be able to produce elegant cuisine like their non-Jewish peers, but that was kosher and was very simple. He just left out ingredients that weren't kosher and he uh, separated milk, milk dishes from meat dishes. And he even included a section called um, uh, uh, flour, flour and milk dishes. In other words, desserts and pasta that would be good for dairy meals. So it was a very kind of a simple kind of way of 
taking recipes that were already in circulation and adapting them so that they would be kosher. So that is truly what I call a kosher cookbook written by a Catholic chef who was the, um, he was the, uh, and, and, and incidentally, the next year, he publishes a German cookbook, includes all the recipes that are in the Jewish cookbook, plus a bunch more. So 344 recipes in the Jewish cookbook, and there were 616 in the, in the other cookbook. So he was the personal chef of the Grand Duke in the state of Baden. So he, in a way, inaugurates this genre that I call kosher gourmet, that I view, at least at this stage, not as a Jewish cookbook, but as a kosher cookbook. There's no instructions for how to keep kosher. The assumption is, is that the women that are going to get this cookbook already know how to keep kosher. What they don't know is how to make gourmet cuisine. So they know how to keep kosher. They just need recipes that they can use that are adapted for their kitchen. Now, so that, and now he lived between 1777 and 1842. And this is, uh, the cookbook was published in 1815. So there's not another male cook, Jewish cookbook author un, really until the 1890s, until much later in the century, because the next Jewish cookbook to be published is in fact by a woman and the ones after it, they're all by women. And it is 1835 by Rachel Ashman. Now, the title of hers is, and, and it's interesting how these authors try to differentiate their cookbooks one from the other. So hers is, she calls it Geprüftes Kochbuch für Israeliten. It is a tested cookbook for Israelites, for Jews. And she goes on, based on her many years of experience. Now, Stolz didn't have to say based on his many years of experience because he was obviously known as a chef. But here we see that there are women that have, quote, many years of experience. Usually that doesn't mean as a housewife. Usually what it means is as a professional cook, whether in a, a, a family household, a well-to-do family, or as a caterer or in some other fashion. And, uh, and here, what was fascinating is she doesn't offer any instructions for keeping kosher because again, the assumption is that her readers know how to keep kosher, but that they need to know how to cook gourmet in a kosher way. Now, I would say that this kosher gourmet phenomenon is a very interesting case of culinary acculturation that is part of a process of embourgeoisement, of, in a sense, um, acquiring the capacity, cultural, social uh, capital to qualify as being part of the bourgeoisie and being in the same league as your non-Jewish peers. So it's, I think the cookbooks themselves are extraordinary instruments of social mobility and, uh, and expressions of social aspiration. Now, this, in her case, even though, you know, it says it's a cookbook for Jews and it's kosher, it, hers is, the, it's, in, in her case, she's actually including a few Jewish specialties, just sort of tucked in here and there, not a separate section, not, and not integral to the entire, to the entire um, operation. So we don't know much about her, except what she says, uh, you know, in the, in the title, that she has many years of experience. And um, she, uh, the, the cookbook itself, I think is a very, very interesting one. And, um, and a very, very special one. So what's actually in her cookbook? So soups and beef and calf and all kinds of meat dishes and then fowl and fish and you know, all the categories that you, would, um, that you would expect in a normal cookbook. If you look at the table of contents, you would have no idea that it was kosher and you would have no idea that it was Jewish. It was really, it was, it was uh, the essence of uh, kosher gourmet, but but in her case, she does actually include uh, some, some a few Jewish dishes. Now, the the, the 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 third Jewish cookbook published in the 19th century was published in Hungary. It's the first Jewish cookbook to be published in Hungary by by Julie Löw, and now she distinguishes hers, and the title tells you. So this one is the thrifty Jewish cookbook. Uh, or a new and complete cookbook for Jews. So clearly if she says new and complete, it's not like Stoltz saying nothing like this has ever been published before. She's clearly aware 
that there have been at least there has been at least one other, if not two other cookbooks published before her. So a new and complete cookbook for Jews, an indispensable handbook for hospitable women and daughters. And she published it in 1840 in a second edition, edition in 1842. So this one actually came out in two editions, which is already a sign that there seems to be a growing, a growing market. And hospitable, hospitable women and daughters tells you that these are cookbooks that are less important for everyday cooking and more important for special occasions, for holidays, for weddings, for guests, so that especially if you want to you know, impress your guests, you've got to be able to do something other than and more interesting and, uh, and more impressive than what you would cook on an everyday basis. Now, she, in her, in her preface, she doesn't mention that she wrote this book for Jewish women who kept a kosher kitchen. In fact, the words Jewish and kosher don't even occur in the text. And um, um, the, uh, the, uh, Andre Kerner, who is writing a book about these early Jewish cookbooks, he says that maybe, and she simply copied the preface from another cookbook because intellectual property, people were copying one from one cookbook to another without um, any compunction. And so she says nothing about the requirements of a kosher kitchen, again, assuming that Jewish women already knew that, that's not what they bought the cookbook for, nothing about Pesach, and she seems to have copied almost everything from the Ashman cookbook that had been published in 1835. So, it, it, uh, and she did the same thing that the others did, and she also provides instructions if if this fish recipe is to go with a dairy meal, you, you should change the recipe in such a way. So she, she provides these alternate ways of preparing food so that they can be served either with a meat meal or, or with a dairy meal. Now, and this is the last one I'll, I'll tell you about before I actually turn to the ones that I own because these early cookbooks are scarcer than a hound's tooth and I would kill to have them, but being a, they just they're just not on the market and they're very 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 rare and one of the rarest of all that has survived in exactly one copy in um, Amsterdam is one of the most interesting and it is uh, published in 1854 and published in uh, actually published in Hungary pu published in Pest and it is okay so let me give you the title and I'm going to read the title as it appears in I would say Jewish letters because Hebrew Yiddish will discuss that in a minute. Nais vollständiges Kochbuch für die jüdische Kirche. Ein und berliches Handbuch für jüdische Freuen und Tochter nebst Vorschrift von Fleisch koscher machen und Challe nehmen überhäupt über Reinlichkeit und Kaschut. Now, what language is that? What language is it? Of course, I'm dying for it to be Yiddish, but unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So what is this? This is the only cookbook of its kind that I'm aware of, and that is, the, it, it, it is described, I mean, you know, Andre uh, Kerner describes it as Hebrew lettered German. In other words, basically German in Hebrew letters. But Jeffrey Chandler, in a wonderful new book, Yiddish, a biography, argues for the fluid boundaries of the language. And that is that rather than thinking, uh, and of course, with the development of standard Yiddish and, um, and all of the ideological investments in Yiddish as quote, a language, there is a kind of policing of the boundaries. But in real life, languages don't have such clear boundaries. And he, uh, Jeffrey um, cites a, uh, there's a whole body of literature on what's called trans, trans languaging. In other words, that the boundaries of Yiddish are fluid and especially in German speaking lands where the where Yiddish is closer to the co-territorial language than it is, for example, in Slavic countries like in Poland or in Russia. So what happens is there's a kind of fluidity from, if you will, um, a kind of Western Yiddish, uh, a kind of, I would say, Deutschmerisch or highly Germanized Yiddish to something that looks like German in Hebrew letters, and it's a phenomenon unto itself. It's not kind of a one-to-one -one tra uh, transliteration or romanization. So, okay, so to translate the title, a new and complete cookbook of the Jewish cuisine, an indispensable handbook 
for Jewish women and daughters with instructions for koshering meat and separating challah, as well as for gen general cleanliness, I would say probably hygiene, and kashrut, 78 pages. So it isn't a really big one. And this, so for me, this, this cookbook was an absolute quandary. I'm asking myself, the, uh, the, the ones before and the ones after are in German. All the early 19th century Jewish cookbooks are in German. And of course, German was a Kultursprache. So even if you're, you know, you're, you're in Hungary, or you're in Budapest, then you have, you know, people, people are, are uh, people certainly educated um, elite are going to be speaking uh, and reading German. Now, so what exactly is going on here? Well, first of all, there's no author. So what does that mean? It means that the publisher had some, you know, the publisher, the publisher was a publisher of prayer books and he had a company that the company itself actually um, was operating from the mid 18th century or from the late 18th century into the 19th century. And they mainly published prayer books also um, the, um, translated into German in Hebrew letters. So um, um, uh, Andre Kerner argued that, well, maybe it was easier for these women to, to read German in, in, and it was actually Vibertite letters. The letters aren't even like square letters. They're the kind of letters that you would expect in books that were intended for women, like the Tzene Verena, their, their prayer books, etc. So what did he think he was doing? And so let, let's see what he has to say. He says, and this is for Mr. Levy, the publisher. Um, and he's, he's blatant. He doesn't even try to disguise the fact that he took the recipes from other books. He says, in the present small cookbook, I try to collect the best, healthiest, and tastiest dishes as well as their methods of preparation from the latest and best cookbooks. So no originality here. It's just that what is original is that he is publishing it in, if you will, Hebrew lettered German. Now, he doesn't mention that the book was intended for religious Jews. Why would he? If, if, he's, giving, if he's giving instructions for koshering and for taking challah and, uh, and for Shabbos, he, he doesn't have to say this is intended for religious Jews. It is self-evident. Besides which, it's in Hebrew letters. Who else, who else would it be for? And then he goes on, and it's the only indication that he expects his readers to be Jewish. Therefore, I intend this work written in an easy and understandable style. So somehow he seems to think that by presenting it in German, in Hebrew letters, which would suggest that these women are actually in some kind of transition, that they can read Yiddish, that they can read the Hebrew prayer book, that they can, and that they speak, the, that they speak uh, some, you know, whatever the boundaries are, some form of German, Yiddish, German, Yiddish, whatever, whatever this sort of fluid language situation is. And he says, therefore, I intend this were written in an easy and understandable style for my nation's previously mentioned gender, meaning women. And I suggest to all, all the women that they should use it frequently and diligently. So what I find fascinating about this cookbook is that it is intended for religious women. Religious women know how to do all these things. So in talking with, uh, with Jeff Chandler about this, because we went down the rabbit hole of translanguaging and trying to figure out what this strange text is, he said, you know, quite often those instructions are given as a way of affirming what those Jewish women already know. In other words, the presumption is not that you have to tell them how to do something that they don't know how to do, but rather that in a way you are increasing the credibility of the halachic um, authenticity, uh, accuracy, authority of the book by providing those instructions. And this is what I find extraordinary here is that there, there are no Jewish recipes to speak of. These are also gourmet, you know, basically gourmet dishes, but it's a, it's, it is, if you will, an intensely, it's, it's an intensely Jewish book. And, and why is it, and, and also, um, you know, uh, well, let, let me give you a little bit of a sense of what's actually, what, um, among other things, there are recipes for liver, lungs, brain, sweetbreads, spleen, tongue, and even tripe. So, and that's really old school. 
I mean, I know some of these dishes from my my own childhood, but um, I do think that it tells you uh, that even those uh, cheaper so-called cuts of meat could make their way into, into a book like this. Now, what I find so interesting is that the, this, this volume is different from the other ones because of all the ways that intensifies the Jewish character of the book, but not in, in its cuisine. It is not, quote, this is more than a kosher cookbook. And its Jewishness is not in the inclusion of Jewish dishes so much as it's being Hebrew lettered and including all of this halachic uh, instructions, all this halachic information. And so the, what, the, what the cookbook does is it identifies the reader as Jewish and it identifies the cookbook as Jewish and it, it doesn't so much, and, and, and in that regard, because it's being kosher, the kitchen is Jewish, but not necessarily the cuisine. So I think that it is really an absolutely fascinating, fascinating volume. And now to what I actually have in my collection. So um, the single most popular Jewish cookbook, I would say before World War I, was Rebecca Wolf. Now we know very, very little about her um, other than she says that she lived in a lot of different areas, a lot of different regions, presumably of German and German speaking lands, and that her cookbook um, actually reflects a kind of regional uh, diversity, but it is classic, classic. So I, as I said, I collect multiple editions. I happen to own four editions of the 14 that she published between 1851 and 1935. And since she was born around 1801, the later editions were clearly published after her death. And so you can imagine a cookbook that was published in 1851 is still going in 1935 under Nazi, uh, during the Nazi period. It's extraordinary. So to give you a sense of sort of the elegance of the covers, and if you look at the covers, you can see them move from this, this sort of mid 19th century style to um, a, a sort of a Jugendstil, and then also, and also Art Deco. And then when we come into the 20th century, and I'm sorry, I don't have ones from the 30s, but you start to see that it's moving into a kind of modern German, and then eventually it will look very much like what you would imagine in the, um, uh, in the Nazi period. So what's the title of this one? So this one, um, and I'll give you the, um, uh, the again, it's for Israelite women. It's, a, you know, we, nothing's changed. Cookbook for Israelite women containing all the different cooking and baking methods of the areas where the author has always lived for a number of years. So that actually really distinguishes it from the others, combined with precise instructions on how to set up and run a religious Jewish household. So here we, again, it's, it's, it's kosher gourmet for sure. And it is, and, and I'm not really sure, I think, well, certainly by the time she's publishing, by 1851, clearly there's a market. Because if there weren't a market, she would not be able to bring out 14 editions all the way to 1935. Now, not only, not, and this, is, this was for me like an incredible treasure, for me, not only did she bring out 14 editions in German, but she also brought out a, a, a Dutch translation in 1881 and even earlier Polish translations. And the Polish translations are amazing. So here's the first, this is the first Jewish cookbook. Well, not Jewish, kosher. The first kosher cookbook pu published in Poland, 1877. And uh, this is a facsimile. I would, again, I would kill to have the original. And it is Polska Kuchnia Kosherna. In other words, it would be, I would say, cooking uh, in the uh, kosher, kosher cooking in the Polish way. Now, there is nothing Polish about this. This is Rebecca Wolf. This is 100% Rebecca Wolf, who is including recipes from all the places where she lived for several years, which means German speaking, 
uh, regions, um, including, of course, it would, inc it would include the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so, we, so that would be, that was um, 1877, and, um, and it, it, it includes uh, baking and jams and uh, drinks, juices, uh, and that's 1877. But then, and this is, you know, this came out in two editions, 1877, and then it comes out again in 1904, in 1904. And this time, the, the Polska is gone. So instead of being Polska Kuchnia Kosherna, it's simply Kuchnia Kosherna. It just says kosher cooking. So now we're sort of maybe on safer territory because there's nothing Polish about it. And it says, um, uh, it means that, that it is a guidebook or a handbook rather for um, every Jewish home. And it is how to prepare all these different dishes and to do so in a way that follows, uh, uh, that is appropriate for a Jewish religious household. So, um, so those are the, those are two uh, ed, 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 not, well translations, um, and they're they're not exactly the same. It looks like the, it was retranslated, or at least it was published. The, the second edition of it is sort of slightly different. However, this cookbook continues to appear today, and in multiple editions. And in, and in variations of the title. So we had the Polish, essentially kosher cooking in the Polish way, kosher cooking. Now we've got Jewish cooking or Jewish kit, the Jewish kitchen or Jewish cook cooking by Rebecca Wolf and it's reworked by Barbara Adamczewska. So now it would seem that what interests the contemporary reader is not that the, the uh, it's not that it's kosher, it's that it is Jewish. And of course, these are again, recipes from, from Rebecca Wolf. So this is, this is an extraordinary, um, really an extraordinary story. And what I found especially interesting is what happens to this cookbook in the 1890s when um, some, well, there, when it, when basically it becomes the basis for a Yiddish version. I wouldn't call it a Yiddish translation in the sense that it's not a word, word for word Yiddish translation, but there is a, a, a writer basically, Euser Blostein, who publishes in 1896 in Vilna and 1898 in New York, he publishes Kochbuch für jüdische Freuen. And it's largely recipes from Rebecca Wolf. And what's so interesting is that he's not a, he's not a cook. He's not a cookbook author. He's a bit like the publisher. He sees an opportunity. He's a bit like Harkavi. He's publishing all kinds of things. And a lot of them are very, very uh, popular. So he's publishing um, dictionaries and he's teaching Russian and he's uh, you know, the author of a manual for the study of Hebrew. Uh, he translates into Russian the Hebrew prayer book and the Machser. He publishes all kinds of novels um, and he does, um, uh, I would say uh, Judeo-German dialect uh, stories. So, you know, the cookbook was just like another thing to do. And how easy is it if you can just take the recipes from anywhere? So that represents, from my point of view, the first published cookbook, at least in the Yiddish language. So I would call it a Yiddish cookbook. And I think that it is um, a very, very interesting, a very, very interesting case. So let me turn now to my... I would say probably my real favorites, if I had to, you know, you can't pick among your children, but if I had to, I would say my, my real honest to gosh um, favorites. And that is a pair, of, a pair of cookbooks and the surprising discovery that, that I was able to make. So, uh, but before that, let me just see. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, so let, let me go there. So, um, there is a wonderful little cookbook called Gastronomie Juive. Gastronomie Juive. And it's, it's cuisine et pâtisserie de Russie, d'Alsace, de Roumanie et d'Orient. So Russia, Alsace, Romania, the Orient, but the Orient usually means like Egypt, Tunis, Algeria, that kind of thing. And the word kosher in Hebrew letters, which means that if you're not Jewish or you can't read Hebrew, you don't know what it says. But if you are, it's like coded language. And, and it's actually juive because now we're in 1929. 
1929 in France is a whole other story. So Suzanne Roch uh, Rochomovsky, maiden name is Bloch, so this must be her married name. She is a writer of sentimental, uh, you know, stories and that kind of thing. And this is the only, uh, and, and poetry especially, um, no novels, um, and often on a Jewish theme like Au Jardin d'Israël, uh, um, a, um, a, um, a novel or some short stories. But here's the only cookbook she ever writes. Now, how does she begin it? Does she begin it with how to take challah, how to keep a house kosher, uh, with an admonition to the, um, uh, to the reader uh, about how they need to know how to run a household? No. Her avant-propos begins with, Le petit David du village de Lève était un enfant remarquable qui faisait de l'orgueil du, du raider et de ses parents. In other words, little David is the pride of his parents. He's the, the smartest kid in the Cheder. So it starts there. And voici notre petit David. So it's very sort of sweet and very nostalgic, clearly set in Galicia. And it takes us through his childhood until finally he gets married. And the test, the test of his bride-to-be is her noodles, her luxion. So that the, the idea, that the, and this is pure Rochomovsky, kind of this sort of sweet, romantic, nostalgic. In other words, life has changed so much and Jewish life has certainly in Western Europe and in France has moved so far from the, if you will, 19th century, uh, what would be associated with Alsace, a kind of relic area, that it is safe to be super nostalgic about it. So the biggest section here is Russian food. And I should say that Kosher isn't the issue. It is kosher, but this is truly a 100% Jewish cookbook. It is Jewish dishes from beginning to end. So what does that mean? And I am sure that you will recognize them as we go. So why she has her first soup in the whole book is soup with hard boiled eggs for the Passover Seder. So salt water with hard boiled eggs. I have no idea why you would start any cookbook with that. So cold beet borscht, chav, cabbage borscht, gefilte fish. And she says, buy a live carp. And then she gives you instructions for how to kill it and, and, and to stuff the slices. Picha, chold, semis, lakshin, farfel, mandlin, kreplach, knedlach, halkalach, pierogi, latkes, varenikes, kugel, teglach, homentash, and raisin wine, povidl. For starters, that's just the beginning. And then she's got another big section on Alsace with Kugel, Chremslach, because Alsace, as I said, is a kind of a relic area where a lot of old traditions survive, not only Jewish, but also among the local population. Germany, mainly cakes and desserts. Romania, very small section, just uh, one page 176 to 81. Goulash, veg, stuffed eggplant, zucchini, stuffed grape leaves. So you're already moving towards the Middle East. And then what she calls Oriental, which is Tunisia and Egypt, which is very, 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 very small. Now, that, okay, so that is, that's interesting. But uh, I found, and eventually after decades, I acquired a very rare and my most, most, most precious cookbook. It is, the Yiddish Koch, and the full title appears inside in Alla Lendel. Now hers was Russia, Alsace, Romania, and the Orient. This one is Poln, Russland, Romania, Germany, Alsace, Morocco, Tunis, America, Unazobaitel, and, and more, etc. And it says the best and most practical uh, book for the Jewish household, for the Jewish home. Farlag Gastronomia, Warsaw, 1930. Well, something was fishy. Uh, you know, it, it, there was just something about it. It's by, by Base Shafran. There was something about it that I just, I don't know, I, I had this feeling that I have seen this before. And sure enough, when I had the opportunity to really look more carefully at it, I discovered that it had illustrations that are straight out of 
gastronomie juive. In other words, this is a pirated Yiddish translation one year after gastronomie juive is published. And if, if you, you know, I thought that the Hebrew lettered German cookbook was completely surprising and anomalous, but this one is too. And it is not only because, and of course I love it because it's in Yiddish, but not only because it's a Yiddish cookbook uh, published in a thousand copies. So you can imagine how scarce it is. How, how I was able to buy a, a copy of it is beyond me. I've never seen it come up again. But the question is, what is it? Who is it for? And why is it in Yiddish? So we have to go to the introduction. And the introduction, I, I'll just read you what he says. And then ask yourself, if, if it is for the women he says it's for, why is it in Yiddish? And why is it 100% typical Jewish dishes, including dishes from, for, with, with ingredients they can't even get their hands on? So, so basically, he, admo he admonishes Polonized Jewish women, uh, asking them, how dare they turn the health of their families over to servants rather than pursue the culinary arts themselves? Christian women, he pointed out, are more attentive to the care of their families. And so he writes something he calls a word to our Jewish wives. And he reports a conversation that he ostensibly overheard between two young ladies. This scenario, I, he had to have made it up. And he never, he never wrote another cookbook. I mean, he's obviously not a cook and not a cookbook author. I mean, he just simply took the, the, um, the Ruchamovsky uh, book. You have absolutely no idea, Sabina, explained one to the other with a certain pride, how much I hate the kitchen, how much I can't stand it, so much so that I never set foot in it. Kill me if I know how to cook a little cereal or a pot of potatoes. And you think I'm better? Asked, uh, answered the, the Kolejanka, in other words, this sort of Polonized wor word for her girlfriend, um, answered the Kolejanka uh, coquettishly. A month ago, my Leon had terrible stomach problems. The doctor ordered him on a diet and he had to have pleiakis, so it would be gruel or like porridge, prepared for him. Just his luck, the servant also fell ill and I, let it never be said, had to be the cook myself. No, no, don't ask what kind of clay kiss I cooked. And Saffron goes on to explain, outside of Poland, a girl gets a diploma in public school and takes examinations in culinary arts. So it should be among us. And he offered his cookbook as a step in that direction, notwithstanding its focus on down home cooking and the inclusion of North African Jewish cuisines. And, and of course, it's just all the same dishes that, that uh, you know, that, that we heard about that were in the Rachamovsky volume. So what I want to know is this, what did this guy think he was doing? He is addressing highly Polonized women who hate the kitchen and hate cooking. He is admonishing them that they should cook for their husbands. And he is offering them recipes that are nothing like anything their cooks are probably cooking if they're so, if these kolejanki, these, these, these uh, friends that are so polonized, what are they gonna be? They're gonna make chont? They're gonna make a filter fish? Hardly. So how he thought, why he thought that translating the Rachamovsky book, which is pure nostalgia, is like relic ethnography. I mean, it is like, it is unacculturated, 100% typical Jewish dishes. Why he thought, presenting those to a highly Polonized woman in the Yiddish language, assuming that you even would bother to pick up a Yiddish book and read it, I, find, I, I, I just find this completely anomalous. And what it suggests is that, first of all, it's a guy, because I cannot believe that a woman would do this. I just, I, I just can't believe it. And it, it is, um, I, I would say it's a bit like the publisher of the 1854, cookbook in Hebrew letters, it is an opportunity that a professional writer or publisher sees and then creates a cookbook. And in both cases, they are completely, totally, and utterly anomalous. So what I'd like to do by way of, of well, more or less conclusion is to 
share with you a recent acquisition that came my way and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. But before I do that, um, I just want to say that, and this is, and it, this, and in fact, this is part of the story that among my most precious possessions are in fact the cookbooks that women themselves kept. And these cookbooks are very much German women, uh, German Jewish women uh, would do them. I mean, of course, German women as well. And some of them, this is Kochbuch Greta Jacobi. And it's just really in a notebook. Some of them are in fancy kind of plush, like pleather or leather bound volumes. They might've been given a blank one for a, as a wedding gift or a bridal gift, and then proceeded to, to write in them. They are written out in a very, very careful hand, very, very beautiful, careful hand. So I have several of these. These are very, very precious because obviously they only, they're, they only come in one copy. You're not gonna find more than one copy. Also, um, by way of sort of wrapping up the story of these 19th century cookbooks, you can get a feeling of what the earliest ones, some of the earliest ones look like. This is like, this is the size of here. This is the size of my hand. This is tiny. And this one, also very precious, is uh, Die Praktische Israelitische Kirchen. So, and these, these are like basic, uh, basic instructions for original dishes of the Israelite, meaning the Jewish kitchen, um, and the ritual laws. And this one is 1867, Rebecca Hertz. So it is really, really, really special. And so, uh, but, but look what happens. What happens is that by, well, this is 1930, but this one is a 19th century cookbook. But by 1930, those little tiny volumes become these gigantic books. And these gigantic books become a, a favored uh, wedding gift, uh, a gift for young brides and for, uh, as, uh, you know, particularly on the occasion of a wedding, not because those young brides will necessarily cook for them, but because they will have to supervise those who do cook for them, their servants and their, uh, and their, and their cooks, if they're, depending on how big the household is. Now, um, a, a colleague of mine that goes back, I think, 30 or 40 years, knew I was working on this topic. And he said to me that he moved into a house and that the woman that lived there before left a lot of stuff in the house and that he didn't know what to do with all this stuff. Was I interested? Well, was I interested? Is the grass green? Was I interested? So I acquired... Helen's Kitchen. Now, Helen's Kitchen had a lot of strange stuff in it, including refrigerator magnets, Ben-Gurion, Shalom, and, but most importantly, what it had, which is so unbelievable, is it had her collection of recipes, which she saved in a ring binder and of course all the pages are brittle but in a ring binder and everything is in Yiddish including clippings from the Yiddish press from the food columns so we have here I, I just opened it up at, at random a Floyman uh, strudel so a plum strudel um, a, a malina syrup a raspberry syrup and a lot of them are are handwritten. And I mean, this, this woman, she must have really cooked because there are hundreds and hundreds of recipes. They're, they're, it's just extraordinary. So, I mean, I hope at one point to be able to really do them justice and go through it, but also to have this digitized because it is so precious. And they're clearly here. She's also used pages from a notebook um, and not only from the ring binder. Now, in addition, in addition, she had some cookbooks and she's, a, she's a, a gal after my own heart. And that is product cookbooks, of course, including the back of a matzo meal, uh, box of matzo meal for making, um, in this case, breading, uh, chremsel, knedlach, but also, of course, tempting kosher dishes by the Manischewitz company, and here, uh, Lantern's peanut oil for Pesach and tempting kosher dishes also 
from uh, Manishevitz Matzah, Matzah Mail, and Matzah Farfel. Well, what I love about these is they are, they're the other side of that German letter, no, Hebrew letter German, because these are bilingual cookbooks. Bilingual cookbooks, Yiddish and English. The idea being that somehow or other, those immigrant mothers, those Yiddish speaking immigrant mothers, they open it from right to left. Betamte Yiddish Meicholim, uh, from the Manischewitz um, company uh, in Cincinnati and uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, America. Everything's spelled, of course, in, in Yiddish. So you open it from right to left and mom can cook. You open it from left to right and the daughter can cook. Now, what was, what was this about? It, it was you know, bilingual, but also you could say that it was bicultural too. And what was the intention? Why should Jews only consume matzah for Pesach? When, from a Manashevitz point of view, you could be consuming matzah all year long, if only you knew what to do with it. So what could you do with it? Well, let's see. There, there, um, you could make uh, muffins. How about, how about we make matzah muffins? Maybe matzah, matzah waffles? Why not? Or there are some other uh, really lovely matzah pancakes. Oh, a matzah strawberry shortcake. Why not? Or uh, let's see here. And of course, they've got lots and lots of products, including a cake meal, uh, uh, et cetera, a tort, a macaroni loaf, um, knedlach, all kinds, um, meatloaf, et cetera. And, and similarly, for the planters, the planter's one, the planter's one uh, is actually all, uh, it, no, it's also, it's also half, it's half in, uh, in Yiddish and half in, uh, in English and the same with this uh, other uh, Manashevitz one. So that, uh, that material from Helen's Kitchen was a real treasure. And especially what's wonderful from, uh, for me is that with many of the books that I was able to buy, I don't know who owned them. I don't know what their provenance is. Uh, I don't know how they were used, but the material that I have from, from Helen's Kitchen is this incredible collection. And I know, we know a little bit about her, not very, very much, but I'm intending to get in touch with her family because she seen, it seems she died um, at the age of 95 and has daughters and grandchildren. So I'm really eager to learn more about her because it's a very special, uh, very, very special collection. Now, um, finally, Yiddish cookbooks continue to be published. And you might ask why and how. Well, in one case, in, in, in English translation, the, this is the Levando, Fania Levando's vegetarian Yiddish cookbook published in Vilna. Very, very interesting volume. And Yivo, uh, thanks to the translation made by E. Jochnowitz, published a, um, an English uh, language version. We want to bring out a new edition of it. But uh, in terms of ones that are actually being published in Yiddish today, uh, some of them are really odd. Here's a privately published one. My Holland zum Gesund mit Ariba Hindert Rezepten. Dishes uh, for health uh, with over 100 recipes. And this is a privately published cookbook. I think it's published in Brooklyn. And I think this one was published. Um, oh, yes. And it was, yeah, it was absolutely produziert, geschrieben. So it was produced, written, and tested by, by Malka, 1990. And it is, you know, obviously the computer age, and she was able to bring out her own, uh, uh, in a very, very small edition. So collecting something like that. But also there are Hasidic cookbooks in Yiddish. And this one was published in, um, in Israel. And in this one, it's um, and it, it's very, I, I think, appropriately titled "Fun der Mamis Koch" from from Mother's uh, Kitchen, and it, it says at the bottom, we know that it's, it's it's by Sheen Ziesel, and it says kosher. So it, you know, obviously, they had to specify it, and it has a lot of traditional recipes in it, but it's now in a whole other league with, of course, a little bit of food styling and and uh, glossy uh, glossy images. So to conclude, uh, I would say that cookbooks offer an extraordinary opportunity to 
see the ways in which women in particular in their kitchens and at their table and through the way that they prepare food, think about food and entertain and care for their families that there, in a way, it is a kind of barometer of changes in Jewish life and also the diversity and the range of uh, Jewish expression. Uh, there's, there's obviously much more that can be done. I have a huge collection of charity cookbooks and these fundraisers are very, very interesting as well. And particularly interesting are the, uh, are the I would say the modern Orthodox cookbooks, which are uh, kosher by design. There's a whole there's a whole set of them, so um, there's a a lot to be done, and I hope that this presentation of some gems from my collection and what I find interesting about them might inspire others to take cookbooks seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. That was a wonderful um, presentation. Um, so Susie and I were gonna. Um, look in the Q&A and, and pose questions to you. Um, I would say I just had a chance to look through them right now. And um, there's sort of two categories, one about your uh, how you collect, where you keep your cookbooks as well. Um, so questions about that. How do you acquire these titles? Um, and then there are also some, some historical questions and questions about um, you know, suggestions for other titles and so on. So I wonder, maybe you should start with the ones to talk a little bit about your, the, your collection, like where do you keep them? How do you acquire titles? Oh and so my on. God, you know, um, all right. I'm gonna change my screen just a second. I'm going to, just you give me a half a second and you'll see the answer. You'll see the answer in a minute. Okay, that's the answer. <laughs> so, I mean, this is uh, where we were living uh, from 1974 to, nine, to 2018 and we've moved, but I actually, we've moved with my, with, with my library and the entire, our entire living area is floor to ceiling books and they're all on industrial steel shelves. When we, um, uh, when we moved into the loft that we had in starting in 1974, I went to B&Z Steel, which was in Soho, and they dealt and used industrial steel. There's nobody like that anymore. You can't you can't find this anymore. And so I I wanted used uh, because I couldn't afford anything else. They had two big huge vats of paint, um, like a dark kind of a green and gray, and they would just dip these old steel shelves into these vats, let them dry. And then they would, uh, it was like a mechano set. They would send over all the parts, assemble it on the spot and then mount them on the, on the wall. So basically I had, I didn't, these were not like beautiful Ikea kind of, you know, wooden shelves. These were industrial steel shelves. And that's what I, I wanted to actually continue to, to do just that here in, the, in my new place. Uh, so basically that's, I, I have them on shelves and I have them obviously organized because the, my whole cookbook collection is now, I think I mentioned between six and 7,000 volumes and there's about maybe 1200 plus uh, just the Jewish ones. So how do I collect? Well, I would say that partly in the beginning it wasn't a concerted effort, but then when I really put my mind to it and it became concerted, I, I actually benefited from the, our cookbook dealers and cookbook bookstores. So Kitchen Arts and Letters, for example, Knack Wax, Waxman's wonderful, wonderful bookstore on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Um, then there, there were other uh, cookbook dealers, private cookbook dealers. They didn't have a store, but they had catalogs. And there is um, Bonnie's uh, cookbook store in, in Lower Manhattan. Uh, so those dealers were really, really great because they knew what I was looking for. And when something came up, they would let me know. So I, I worked with uh, cookbook dealers then I also got catalogs from antiquarian book dealers, and especially there's a Swiss antiquarian book dealer that specializes in, uh, in cookbooks. So I was able, for the really rare ones, I was able to find them in these European antiquarian book dealer catalogs. Then I would say that uh, I also, of course, went to the Strand and 
they, I found a lot of interesting material just on the shelves. And what was great about that is I could just browse and they were not very expensive so I could manage it. Then I, I also, of course, uh, bought, bought on eBay and also at a time when nobody else was interested in them and especially the fundraisers. And then I really thought I got to get really systematic here. So I then sent out a query to synagogues, JCCs, Jewish libraries, uh, all kinds of Jewish organizations. And I asked them, had they ever put together a community cookbook or a fundraiser and that I would be, I would love to have it and um, I'll buy it or they can give it to me, whatever. So I collected a lot of the fundraisers that way. And then when that sort of dried up, I thought, well, wait a minute, there's about three or four printers that are printing fundraisers for everybody, for churches, for synagogues, for, you know, whatever. So I started to contact the printers and I asked them, did they have copies of these books in their files? Because what they would do is they would actually put a copy and they would write with a big black, uh, like a marker on it to, you know, to indicate that it was like a file copy. I said, I, it's okay with me, I'll take file copies. So then I got a lot of those file copies from the, um, the printers of those charity cookbooks. Um, and then people were really kind and they knew that they had somebody died and there were cookbooks and they didn't know what to do with them and were I interested. So then it was like this most recent, like Helen's Kitchen, that they would be so kind and actually send them to me. Um, so that's, ba I would say basically, uh, that would be, that would be more or less how, how I went about it. Mm -hmm. Susie, do you want to take the next, next round? Sure. Um, Barbara, there's a number of questions about um, whether you um, still cook um, and whether uh, what recipes, um, recipe books you turn to most um, for your cooking um, and also um, what's your favorite food to make for Passover or other holidays? I know that's way too broad because you are a great cook. But. It's, it's quite okay. So first of all, of course, I'm, 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 you know, I love cooking. I absolutely love cooking. I, you know, not, it, it, there's nothing I like better than to go to our Union Square uh, Green Market, the farmer's market, uh, to walk around Chinatown because it is infinitely interesting. And there's so many things to try that I've never seen before, even after, you know, I, I've been in the city since 1972. So I've been here long enough, you'd think that I knew every nook and cranny, but it's an inexhaustible, uh, like a living encyclopedia of fruits and vegetables and everything imaginable. So yes, so I, I'm an avid, passionate cook and a very adventurous, uh, very experimental, and I just need the opportunity to cook. So in the last 15 years, I've been spending, you know, my most of my time in Poland and in a studio apartment with two burners, no oven and a microwave and a half fridge. So I wasn't doing a lot of cooking. And now with the pandemic, I have, I've got a wonderful kitchen, but I, I, I'm, it, it, I can't have people over, I can't cook for them. So, so yes, the answer is yes, I, I love to cook. Um, as to favorite cookbooks, well, you know, it depends. Um, there, uh, I have, you know, I, uh, well, how, where should I start? There are favorite cookbooks, and some of them are really old school, like Elizabeth David, um, uh, let me think for a second, uh, Deborah Madison, of course, Alice Waters. Um, so a lot, in other words, if I were to look, look for inspiration, I would go sort of farm to table, contemporary of local, fresh. Um, and when I prepare for uh, like a buffet or something like that for a reception or a big group, I always do it a vegetarian, if not vegan. And I love cooking for people with food restrictions. I, that's my favorite. Um, oh, that's another whole story. So, um, and also new ones, you know, Odalengi and uh, they're all, you know, there's just so many interesting new ones. And one of my favorite cookbook authors is Grace Young, who's done three wonderful, wonderful Chinese cookbooks. And I love cooking from her cookbooks. So, um, and, and it just sort of depends. I mean, if I'm baking, if I'm fermenting, if I'm, uh, it just depends on what I'm doing. And uh, so I wouldn't say there's a single one. And as for the Jewish ones, actually my favorite ones are the oldest ones where I'm really looking for the oldest versions and the, one, the versions of recipes that are the least Americanized, where I'm really trying to see, and that's why I love it when they've got long, you know, I mean, 
when I first got married, we were so poor that we ate lung. And, and my, my grandmother's favorite dish, and she could have eaten steak every day of her life, was to saute an onion, chop up some lung, some spleen, and beef cheeks, and just stew it. And it was her favorite thing. And my grandfather, his favorite dish were actually uh, beef testicles that she would roast on a shovel in the fire. So um, I guess, um, I, and, and, and some of the, the cookbooks I turn to are like cheap little paperbacks, you know, maybe F Fanny Grossinger or uh, Jenny Grossinger rather. Uh, so it, it's, um, I, you know, it just, it, it, it depends in terms of, there are ones uh, for cooking. Um, I actually, I would say, if I'm gonna, if I'm looking, for, well, yeah, that's pretty much, I would say that's pretty much what I would do. Oh, favorite dishes. Oh, I would say my favorite probably is latkes. <laughs> and I have a lot of arguments about latkes. We could argue a lot about latkes. <laughs> um, I wanted to turn to a couple of historical uh, questions to sort of uh, ask people asking also for, for recommendations. So see, I'm gonna try and see if I can compress them a little bit. Um, someone had grandparents who were uh, highly regarded caterers in Galicia, but she, they were the kosher gourmet type, but she's wondering if you have a recommendation of cookbooks that might have mirrored the period. Uh, so this was before the First World War, for the, before the beginning of the, of the Second World War, excuse me. If you would have recommendations for cookbooks yes. that might have mirrored, you know, that. Yes, yes, yes. I, I would say that, um, so if we're talking like Lemberg, like Lvov or, um, you know, uh, Vienna, I mean, if we're talking about Austro-Hungarian Empire and of course, um, Galicia is a, a province of it, but that would you know, include Krakow, for example. Um, I would say yes. And I think that my friend uh, Andras uh, Kerner has actually published some really great um, uh, books. So K-O-E-N-E-R, uh, K-O-E-R-N-E-R. And I can, I'll send you the information um, and maybe we can, when you send out the link to the recording, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll put some of that information there. Mm -hmm. And um, also someone asked about the settlement cookbooks. Um, why you didn't, if you, the reason you didn't mention them was because they were in English instead of Yiddish. Yes, I, I, you know, I really, um, uh, my, you know, I, I collect them, of course, and I have, I have a whole shelf of settlement cookbooks, you know, right from the beginning to, to, to today. Uh, and they're very interesting. And I have another whole shelf of Ampabet's cookbook and the ones the sequel to it. Uh, and that would actually be a, another lecture because those are American, uh, American Jewish cookbooks and they are in multiple editions also. And I, you know, if I were to do a lecture just on those, I would probably start with, Ampa, uh, with um, Levy, the Levy cookbook, which, which is uh, the earliest uh, Jewish cookbook published in America. I go to the Ampabet's and then the, the, the um, transformation of it to reflect the influx of East European Jewish immigrants. So that's a wonderful sequence to see what happens to it, the Bloch Publishing Company. Then I would go to the settlement cookbook. And these are German Jewish women who are wanting to train East European Jewish immigrant girls to be domestics in their home. And so they are actually giving cooking classes and they are writing the recipes out and then decide to actually print these cookbooks. So it starts out that way. And then of course it becomes something else altogether. So that's probably, I, I would you know, take that path. And then I'd probably take it all the way to the Jewish Home Beautiful, which is an extraordinary uh, cookbook from the conservative Jewish movement, um, a set of pageants that are set tables for the holidays and then together with recipes. So I would do that sort of a trajectory, but it's, it's another, it's another uh, it raises another set of very, very interesting issues. And it's very, very much an American Jewish story. Mm -hmm. um, Barbara, there's a couple of questions about the, the sort of psychology of cookbooks. Um, one person says that the enthusiasm of these cookbooks suggests an underlying optimism, a tenacity, that whatever was happening in history, a good cookbook was always welcome. Uh, do you think that that's implicit in their publishing? And then relatedly, do you think, or, or how do you think, or do you think cookbooks allow young Jews to connect to their Judaism or their Jewish heritage? Well, they're, they're very good questions. So I would say that um, I think actually that those 19th century cookbooks are born of anxiety. 
Um, and that is um, an anxi the anxiety is uh, the anxiety of upward social mobility, of developing the camp competencies to be socially, culturally, stylistically, in terms of sensibility, um, the, to, to, have, to have those uh, capacities, to have those, to have that kind of capital, social and cultural capital. And I think that the, that they're, in that way they're aspirational. Um, so that would be, so that, you know, if you were going to entertain, have people over, uh, you, you really would like to demonstrate, perform in a way to perform your bourgeois status. So I think that there's that element, but there's another anxiety that I think is maybe even more important. And that is the anxiety that in so doing, young Jewish women would be um, uh, willing to give up kosher in order to be stylish. So that to provide them with a way to be kosher and stylish, so that there's no reason that you can make cuisine that is as beautiful as everybody else's and also kosher, that that was a kind of a, a way to uh, put a kind of a break on not, just, not simply acculturation, because this is culinary acculturation, not just an acculturation, but also an assimilation. And so I, I see it as, I, I see it in some ways as arising out of those, well, anxiety is maybe too strong a word, but um, that those are two aspects of those 19th century cookbooks that I think are really what's, what's driving them. Plus the market, you know, I think that that publisher in uh, Pest in uh, Hungary when he publishes that Hebrew letter cookbook, uh, I think he was testing the market. I think all those single edition books were testing the market just to see, is there a market for these cookbooks? And who, who are they for? Although I can't, I, what is the market for the, the, the chef run? I have no idea from the, uh, the, the pirated Yiddish translation of the French one, I have no idea. There were some questions also about um, uh, women's literacy. If you could talk a little bit about that. Um, sure. Well, you know, it's interesting that if you were to look at Hasidic families uh, in the late 19th and the early 20th century, uh, the women were more likely to know foreign languages. They were reading and um, they, so, I mean, even, even like in a rabbinical court, these were not women that were somehow rather you know, secluded and completely removed from the world. Um, I, I would say that um, uh, if, you know, if we're, if we're looking at this specifically, if we're looking at the world that these cookbooks circulated in, because then it's more precise and speaking in general about Jewish women, that the women who would buy and read and use and give these cookbooks um, are, are described as educated. That's how Stoltz in the very first Jewish cookbook refers to these women, that they are, quote, educated. And educated means that they, from his point of view, it means they can read German. Otherwise he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't publish a cookbook in German. And you can, we can tell from the Hebrew lettered German cookbook that obviously Yiddish, uh, enough Hebrew to be able to read the prayer book and um, uh, German, both to read it, to speak it, uh, to understand it. So uh, that's without formal schooling until later but they had tutors, for sure. And I would say that, uh, and also it's quite different if we're talking about, uh, I would say Western and Central Europe, we're talking about Eastern Europe, there would be differences as well. Um, I have a question from Amy Schumann about the mid 19th century publisher of the prayer books. Um, was he using a Hebrew letter typeface um, or what would have been the typeface okay. of those well, yes. prayer books? Yeah, thanks for asking. So what I just found so amazing is like this. So uh, basically there are two main typefaces. One is the square letter, and that's what you'd find in the prayer book. And the other is, well, cursive isn't the right word or semi-cursive it's sometimes called, which was um, very often referred to as a Vibratite uh, font or typeface. And it, is, it was the typeface that was associated with women's prayers, like Trinus, their supplicatory prayers. It was associated with the Senate of Arena, the Women's Bible. And, and it is that semi-cursive women's typeface 
that is used in this Hebrew letter cookbook, not the square typeface, which is you know, considered more like for men and for liturgical texts. There is a question here about, um, so aside from these, you showed us some of those privately kept cookbooks. Someone asked if there were synagogue sisterhood cookbooks from the 19th century. Yes, uh, there are, there are, believe it or not, there are. And they're fascinating because um, women played, and, and, and I know them really from the United States. I, I'm not aware of them in Europe. So when I've worked with those very, very early uh, charity cookbooks, women were amazing fundraisers. And in the 19th century, and not just Jewish women, women in general, and where you see it in its all of its glory is uh, during the period of the Civil War, the sanitary fairs that women organized to raise money and they published cookbooks in connection with that. And so Jewish women were also, uh, if, if, if for example, the men were not very successful at raising money for the new synagogue building, the women said, we'll do it. And they, they you know, would create a cookbook and then they would do a fair and they would have prizes and they, and they, and they actually raised the money. So they, um, yes, there, and I have worked with them and I do have some from the 19th century. And they're largely German Jewish women. I mean, this whole phenomenon really starts with German Jewish women. Uh, Barbara, when, when I turned 40, my sister and my mother uh, made a cookbook for me of our family favorite recipes. And um, I wonder if you have found that there were cookbooks made in families uh, for rites of passage like weddings or when a baby is born or something like that. And um, I also know that um, your uh, uh, beloved students and friends um, did something for you upon your retirement. And I, wonder, I just wondered if you could talk about the connection between cookbooks and rites of passage or if, if you noticed there to be one. Well, I have not noticed them in relation, let's say, to, let's say, birth, bris, bar mitzvah, or even weddings. Where I've seen it is in relation to um, an, old, an older relative, like a grandmother or a beloved relative. And I have a number of those, and they're wonderful. They really are. Uh, they're a combination of the legacy, sort of the culinary legacy of an old relative, I mean, I, I, I guess you can't call mother an old relative, but, uh, or a grandmother, but you know what I mean. So it's on one hand, it's a, a way of preserving and passing on their culinary legacy, but m even more so, it is usually a way to celebrate them. So it has family photos and it has, you know, people write something. And uh, so those are very, very wonderful. I have a great one from Sydney, Australia. Um, beautiful, beautiful ones. So some of them are handmade, some of them are actually printed in a small edition. Uh, now that you can self-publish, uh, there are, there's a wonderful one called the Cherry Strudel that um, emerged when we did uh, Memories of the Yiddish Kitchen for Yiddish New York this last December. And it turned out that the man who put it together had memories when he was like five years old of being at his grandmother's when she was making a cherry strudel. And he was so mesmerized by it that as a grown person, he oh. immortalized it in a little book that he just printed enough copies for the family uh, with drawings and, you know, with writing and stuff like that. So yeah, absolutely. There's a few questions about, I know this was, you, don't, you only took us sort of to the interwar period, but there are some questions about um, the Second World War and maybe particularly ghettos where their cooks books like, have been found in ghetto archives or, or left behind and, and preserved in one way or the other from ghettos um, or other places where Jews um, were during the, the, the Second World War in hiding mm -hmm. in other places. Mm -hmm. So um, actually the ones that I'm aware of were not from ghettos, they were actually from uh, concentration and death camps, um, but not from, not from ghettos. And they were actually a response to starvation. And it was, there's a very beautiful book that Cara de Silva uh, published, which was a cookbook. Uh, it's called In Memory's Kitchen. And I think it's Theresienstadt. I have to check, I'm not sure. But uh, there are several. Yad Vashem has several, and, and they keep on turning up. 
And basically, um, in some cases, the recipes were never written down, they were just spoken. So that when you know women literally starving would uh, describe, recite and describe recipes to each other. And in some cases actually write them down. And it was, you could say it was vicarious eating. And also it was a way of remembering and uh, one's own humanity by recalling the most, um, I would say civilized uh, expression of who they were and how they had lived before they were so uh, dehumanized um, and, and literally literally starving. So that these recipes are for cakes and torts and you know so for the most wonderful foods. And it's another way that these foods, another way, another way in which these uh, recipes functioned, whether they were only spoken or whether in some cases they were actually written down. Um, I, there are a couple of questions about whether you collect cookbooks from other um, areas, um, uh, including Sephardic cookbooks or from North Africa or things like that that are not uh, Rome based languages. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, uh, you know, anything Jewish at all of any kind. I have one of my uh, most precious is a teeny tiny one from India from I think 1904, 1905, a very, very uh, tiny one. Uh, oh, no, no, I, everything, absolutely everything. Um, so North Africa, Curacao, I have a very interesting cookbook from Curacao, Sephardi, and, and then in Israel, you know, there, there has been in the last 30 years, 40 years, a boom of cookbook publishing. I mean, you know, for every, every different group and of course, every ingredient imaginable and large format and, you know, lavishly kind of coffee table um, books. And then of course, you know, celebrity chefs and is really a real, um, I would say, a blossoming of a cuisine that um, is kind of nouvelle Israeli uh, mixture of from the various strands together with very creative and innovative takes on traditional dishes as well. Uh, there's also a question of, do you have any recipes for home remedies or collect recipes for home I'll remedies? I'll something that's very interesting. In that Rebecca Wolf book, so she kept on adding sections and you know making it bigger and this and that. Anyway, she at a certain point she added a section on the home medicine cabinet, sort of the uh, the, the house apotheca or something to that effect. And in later editions, they left it out because they thought it was dangerous. So <laughs> they you know, in later editions they left it out and they said that with modern medicine we realize that these home remedies are not safe and we have eliminated this section. Wow. So, uh, which is really interesting. So yeah, and in fact, uh, like Anne Babette's cookbook has everything. It tells you how to wash silk. And one of the cookbooks, I think, I can't remember which one says, and we're not gonna include instructions on how to wash silk. <laughs> so taking these other cookbooks to task for not being frivolous, but obviously presuming a kind of status and wealth that would require that you know how to wash silk. So um, yeah, some of them actually have extensive sections on invalid cookery and uh, home remedies and also helpful hints for, how, for cleaning solutions. And yeah, so they can be, you know, that, that's sort of the household part of it and not just cooking. So you've inspired someone to go down this, this road maybe of, of studying cookbooks. So if someone asked if you have any tips or advice for people who might be interested in, in looking at cookbooks in a little more depth, both Jewish, but also just cookbooks generally? What would, what would be your advice for that? Well, um, I would say that the first, the first piece of advice is focus because it's a huge field and there's so many ways to come at it. Like, for example, there's some really, really good uh, books that are monographs, for example, on the joy of cooking which is you know, a cookbook that has had many, many, many editions. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a whole book just about the authors and about that cookbook and all aspects of it. So in a way you could say it's a book about books or it's a book about a book, so to speak. And it's publishing history or um, Jeremy Stolo wrote a very, very interesting book about art scroll and one whole chapter is on um, cooking, uh, it's called Cooking by Design. Uh, it, it's a whole chapter just on the art school cookbook. 
uh, so that, you know, it could be that one takes one cookbook, just one, and analyzes it, or takes, a, 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 and it only appeared in one edition, so very, you know, very small, very, very focused, or a cookbook that was a phenomenon, like Settlement House, Joy of Cooking, etc., or a cookbook author, for example, it's like a whole book about James Beard, you know, for instance, that, um, or uh, about Elizabeth David, or about MFK Fisher, or about Julia Child, or, so it might be that there's a cookbook author, or there's a cookbook that had enormous uh, longevity and enormous influence, or um, that is part of a constellation of books for a particular readership. And it could be interesting, like the ones I think, you know, for example, I think it'd be very interesting to look at, um, in, for ex uh, well, to give you an example, the Spice and Spirit of, I think, is it of kosher cooking? It's the Lubavitch cookbooks. They are fascinating and the women who created them are fascinating. So it, it, it could be it's um, the relations of a cookbook to its community, you know, for, for instance. Um, the, uh, there, there could be a whole, a whole study just of the, way, the ways in which people do or don't use their cookbooks. There's a study of people who collect cookbooks. Um, I would say, yeah, I think that there's a lot of different directions, but focus, that's because it's otherwise it's just too big. One person asked if you consider the cookbooks of Israeli celebrity chefs to be Jewish cookbooks. Well, you know, it's a little bit like, well, this first of all is a bigger question, and that is, is Israeli and Jewish the same thing? I mean, this is a debate in Israel all the time. I remember I was in Israel, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, and a dear colleague of mine who's a, a sociolinguist, I just assumed, you know, if you're Israeli, you're Jewish. If you're Jewish, you're not necessarily Israeli, but if you're Israeli, you're obviously Jewish. And she said, no, they're not the same thing. They're absolutely not the same thing. So I would say that for me, it doesn't actually matter, bottom line. It doesn't actually matter. I, I would rather than start by asking or trying to define uh, what is Israeli, what is Jewish, at what point is a Jewish cookbook Israeli or Israeli cookbook Jewish, I would just put that aside completely and simply take the phenomenon itself on its face and try to understand what it is in and of itself. And then maybe from there, one could start to explore that question. But I wouldn't start with the question. I would actually start with the cookbooks. So I think we are coming up to the end, but I, I must ask a question that has been posed several times now here. And that is bread. Are there Jewish cookbooks that focus on bread? Or can you give recommendations? Oh God, absolutely. Oh, I've got a whole shelf of them. Um, <laughs> there, there, and there is one that I want to get, which is now so rare that it costs, I don't know, $100 and even more. Uh, but I'll, you know what I'll do? If you make a note, I'll, I'll uh, make some recommendations in the, in the chat. I mean, in the uh, follow-up email. But definitely. So I... Um, we're sort of coming up on the end here, and I just wanted to take the opportunity, first of all, to thank you, Barbara, for just a wonderful uh, lecture, and, and thank you for inviting us into your home to, to see your collection. That's been absolutely fascinating. I want to uh, tell the attendees as well that you are giving a talk tomorrow, and I'm, I'm going to put the link to it in the chat um, about museums in a post-pandemic world tomorrow afternoon. Again, um, if you want to attend this, you can absolutely do that, but you have to go into our website and register so you can get in through Zoom again. It's by pre-registration. And it's at 4.30, I believe, right, Susie? Uh, Central No, it's at four, it begins at four o'clock. Four o'clock Central Time. Um, so I, I'm going to put it in the chat, um, but you can also go to the Schusterman Center's website. It's listed there, Museums in the Post-Pandemic World. And Again, thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you also to the to the panelists. And we really look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you.